Thank you so much, Dr. Jeff Flyer. Today is May 12th, 2022. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and kind of when you first remember becoming interested in medicine? I grew up in the Bronx in a middle class neighborhood. Neither of my parents were in the professional world or sciences or medicine. I went to the New York City public schools and I had the opportunity to go to the Bronx High School of Science, which was a very exciting environment for me. Uh, a lot of really smart people interested in science. And it was during that time that I began to think that maybe I would pursue something related to science or medicine. A lot of the people there had that similar set of goals. I went to the City College of New York. And once again, there were a lot of pre-meds there. Uh, and I was trying to decide between medicine and law because I was also interested in, in the legal profession, but chose medicine. And um, uh, it seemed like it was a good way to do something that would be scientifically interesting and evolving over time and would also have the capacity to do good for other people. So I want to back up and just ask you a question, which is, my guess is that you don't get to the science high school that you went to by accident. Did school come easily to you? Did you have to work hard at it? You know, I would say that I worked hard at school. Um, I was not, a, I don't characterize myself as a, uh, a genius. I've known a bunch of those over my years. Uh, so I had to work hard, but when I worked hard, I did well. And the way it works then for Bronx science was apparently different the way it works now for the so-called exam schools. But uh, when I was, you know, in junior high school, probably, and I was, I guess it was in the beginning of the ninth grade, and I was quite young relative to the common way that that worked out. I skipped a grade. I graduated high school at 16. But, uh, you know, the teacher said to me, we would like you to take the exam for Bronx science go to this place on a certain day and take the exam. Uh, and I did. And then I got a note that I was accepted into Bronx Science. It sounded like a good deal. Told my parents. They said, sure, why don't you go there? Main complication it had was instead of walking to the local high school, I had to take buses and trains and sometimes get driven. And it was very clear when I went to Bronx Science that I wasn't the smartest person there. There were some, some of the smartest people I ever knew in my life, including all my years at Harvard, were at Bronx Science. So uh, that was an interesting environment. Uh, would things have been different had I not gone to that school? I don't know. Did either of your parents go to college or were you the first? Well, my father was a pilot in World War II. When he came back, uh, he chose to go more into the sales and business world. Uh, my mother went to college and learned how to be an accountant. But when she married my father, she became a stay-at-home mother, which was totally typical of the time. And then at a later phase, when I was in high school, she got her teaching degree and taught math in, uh, in junior high school for quite a number of years. Uh, but there was no one else was in the professions among my immediate family. I did have an uncle who I was married to my mother's sister, and he was an anesthesiologist. So he was a living, breathing doctor. And I used to talk with him about medicine from time to time. So, and do you have siblings? Yes, I have a brother, two years younger. Uh, he became a physician as well. Your parents must be proud, two doctors. <laughs> right. Well, they're no longer with us, but they yeah. were proud. Okay, so you you go to Bronx Science, then you go to City College, and you're kind of deciding between medicine and law. What steers you in the medicine direction? You know, I've, I've wondered about that many times. I could easily have gone to law school. I could easily have gone to medical school. But I think just the net package of thinking about what it would be like to be a doctor made more sense to me. And at the time, I was thinking entirely about being a practicing doctor. I didn't know of anything else, really. It's one of those things where I kind of sat on the edge for a while. And then when I, I, re I did take all the necessary pre-medical courses, so I set the stage 
so that I could apply to medical school if I wanted to. And then that's what I did. And how did you decide on Mount Sinai as as the medical school you want to go to, particularly given that it was it hadn't existed before your class? Yeah, well, the short story is that at City College of New York, which had an immense class, about half of my high school class went to the City College of New York. There were a massive number of people who said they were pre-med. And at that time, a lot of people didn't get into medical school. You had to be at the relatively higher fraction of the class to get into medical school. Many of us understood there was anti-Semitism. There were schools that you just couldn't possibly get into if you were a Jewish kid from New York City. So, and I was not the absolute top of my class. I was maybe in the top quarter of my class. I did well in some key courses that everybody said you had to get an A in, and I managed to get an A in several of those. And we didn't have much of an advising system either. I remember there was someone we could talk to, and they said, okay, you should apply to these schools. Don't bother with those schools. And then there's this new school, Mount Sinai. You might want to consider that. So I looked into it, and right from the very beginning, I was especially attracted to the idea if I could get in of going to a new school in the first class that would be admitted. That just seemed like an adventure that would be in and of itself something that I should do if I could. So I applied to a number of schools, including some very large state schools that I got into. Uh, And I also got into Mount Sinai. And there was no question in my mind when I got into Mount Sinai that that's where I would go. It was a class of 36. It wasn't like the hospital where the school was was new. It was a a famous hospital. I had known of uh, people who had been patients at Mount Sinai. And then I did a little reading and I saw who some of the initial faculty were going to be. And they were very impressive to me. So I just said, I'm going to go there. And that way I can be part of history. I had a strong feeling that that would be a great experience, life experience to have. Paint the picture for me a bit about what Mount Sinai looked like at that time. What was the physical building like? What were the other colleagues like? Yeah, you know, on the one hand, there was the hospital, which was a series of stately buildings that had been there for a long time. And then there was the medical school. And the medical school, it was kind of a famous, almost funny story. They took over an old New York City bus garage that was across the street from the hospital. They turned it into a medical school building, and they called it the Basic Science Building. And when we went there, it had just recently, the last coat of paint had been put on. You know, everything was fresh and new, but it was a formerly a bus garage. Uh, But they did a good job. My sense was it, it felt like it was a medical school. They had a lecture hall. They had classrooms. They had some laboratories for the faculty who had come and needed laboratories. And, you know, we had a very direct, upfront, close and personal interaction with the people who were leading the curriculum. For example, I will never forget one of the most powerful memories of my life, the first day of medical school. So here was not just the first day of my medical school, but the first day of that medical school. And we sat in this little amphitheater and in the front row were the people who had created the medical school and the chairs of the key departments. And they came up one after the other and gave a short speech about how excited they were that this was the first day of the medical school. I've learned over time that different people have different reactions to those things. At one extreme, there were people who thought it was a lot of BS and hot air and why are those people you know, telling us these stories, let's get down to business. And then there were people like me who said, oh my God, this is history. I can't believe this. I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. And I was in that category. I would say most people were somewhere in the middle. And I remember being extremely impressed by some of the people who spoke, most of them actually. So that was the, that was this context of what it was like to be there And I I remained with that kind of sensibility about the school throughout. Because it was a new school, they didn't have the full faculty that you might have imagined for a school that's been there for a long time. So, for example, I'm well aware and remember very well that they would bring in some famous 
scientists, usually from the New York area, coming from Rockefeller or Columbia or somewhere else, and they would give a lecture on some subject that they were a world's expert on. And I was in the category of people that I can't believe we're having a lecture from this person uh, on this subject. And I, you know, we didn't have a way to Google things, but I looked them up in the library and I realized these were really superstars. And once again, there were a few people, not that many, who would say, why did they bring that, that old codger in to tell us about this? And you know, I, I couldn't understand those comments when I would hear them. And then the class itself was interesting because I would say, as a general rule, the 36 people who entered into the first class were people, by and large, who were interested in the adventure. Almost everybody, if not everybody, could have gone somewhere else, but they chose to go there. There were two poles, in a way, of the 36. There were those who were pretty much focused on becoming doctors. Maybe they were the majority. And then there was a significant minority who wanted to become doctors, but were also, if you remember, this was 1968. Student activism was wild on campuses, the anti-Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the students in the class had been leading activists at various colleges. So they were very politicized. And so we had a group in the class that wanted to sit in in the dean's office and complain about something. And we had other students, more like me, who said, well, what, what are you talking about? Let's work together to make the school work. And I don't want to sit in on anybody's office. That kind of petered out after a while. But that was another memorable aspect. I'm wondering, over your time at Mount Sinai, was there any story or person or experience that had an impact on you and then kind of influenced your kind of medical trajectory, kind of where you yeah, ended up yeah. going in medicine? Yeah. Well, the answer is clearly yes. I mean, and there were many stories, but let me focus on one that has the clearest connection to what I ended up doing for my career. So, and this is a way just like unexpectedly that some choices that Sinai made about how they were going to start the school and who were they going to recruit to lead various efforts and what they were going to include in the curriculum. It just so happened that those things all focused down on me in a way that changed my life. So the first thing is that there were two prominent people who chaired departments at Mount Sinai and they came to Mount Sinai like in that previous year to become the chair. One became the chair of biochemistry. The other became the chair of medicine. Chair of biochemistry was a fellow named Panayotis Katsoyanis. He was chair of biochemistry there for decades. And he was very famous for having been the first scientist in his group to synthesize the molecule insulin. And there was a lot of buzz that people were having. Oh, he was going to win the Nobel Prize for that. And he gave us the first lecture on biochemistry, where he talked about proteins, and he mentioned what he did with insulin and all of this. Then there was the chair of medicine, the inaugural chair of medicine, a man by the name of Solomon Burson. He was the most impressive, most brilliant man I ever met in my life. He was a physician. He became a scientist, even though he didn't have any real training. And he had discovered a methodology, which is called radioimmunoassay, and the first application of that technology in the early 60s was to be, create a technique which, for the first time, you could measure insulin in the blood. So insulin was discovered in 1921, not until he and his co-worker, Raz Yalo, developed this technique, could you measure insulin. He was also a, a chess champion and a concert violinist and a brilliant man. So I used to spend time in both of their laboratories. I decided what could be better than this. First of all, they're both talking about insulin. That, that brings something together. One synthesized it. The other measured it. And then the third thing that happened was we had a course that was very much ahead of its time called Introduction to Medicine that ran a couple times a week from the first week. And they chose diabetes as the disease to feature for the whole year. 
And it went from scientific aspects to clinical aspects. They would bring patients in, children with diabetes, adults with diabetes, pregnancy and diabetes. How do you inject insulin and diabetes and all of this? So I became especially interested in diabetes. As I said, I spent time in Katsayanis' lab. I had many conversations with Saul Burson, and I began to think that I might want to become an endocrinologist and study diabetes and treat diabetes. So then what happened was, so this was during the Vietnam War, and there was a physician draft, and people got lottery numbers that determined how well, likely it would be that they would be drafted after they became doctors. I didn't have a particularly good number. And one of the things you could do to not be drafted, to ensure that you wouldn't be drafted, was you could apply to be in the public health service at the National Institutes of Health. They had a big program and it was extremely competitive from all the medical schools in the country, and they would take a certain number every year, maybe 50 or 100, and they would go down and do various things at NIH. Some were research only, some were clinical, some were clinical and research. And I applied to that in my junior year in medical school. And because I was very highly rated in the class at Mount Sinai, I got in. So I was told that I would get in, but I had to choose a laboratory. And I'll never forget in the, uh, somewhere between the third and fourth year, I made an appointment to talk with Dr. Burson. And I told him that I was gonna go to NIH. And I was thinking about several different labs that I might work in. And he said, stop, I'm telling you what lab to work in. You have to go and work with Jesse Roth. He was my first student in research. And he now runs the diabetes branch at NIH. He's doing the most important work in diabetes. And I'll call him up. You should go and work in his lab. And that's what I did. I will tell you that the other thing that was a tragedy was that Saul Burson died a few weeks or months after I had that conversation with him at the age of 55 or 56. He suddenly died at a national meeting, probably had a heart attack or a stroke. I don't know that that was ever finally figured out. And uh, it was a devastating thing. I remember being at his funeral. We dedicated our yearbook to him, but I never had a chance to talk to him again, obviously, or did anyone else. But I did my residency at Mount Sinai, anticipating that he would be the chair of medicine, which didn't happen because he had died. But then after two years of residency, I went to NIH. I worked in the lab that he had suggested I work in. And that launched my research career. Uh, I made some important observations while I was there as a fellow. That led me to be offered a lot of jobs to be an academic physician scientist. I took one in Boston, and then the rest was history. I spent my career there. And ultimately became the dean of Harvard Medical School. So that's how Mount Sinai uh, set me on the course. Wow. And did you study uh, diabetes and, and endocrine disorders? Yes, I did. So while yeah. I went there, I was there from 74 to 78 at the National Institutes of Health. And the program that I got accepted into, I both did research in the lab and I got trained as an endocrinologist. And then I left in 78 to take a job at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Hospital, that was its name then. And I, my job was to head a new diabetes unit and to be an endocrinologist there. And I stayed there for 35 years until I became the dean of the medical school. I, I became the head of endocrinology there. And then I became the chief academic officer for the hospital is the term that was used. So when you think about kind of that experience, it sounds like this early introduction to these very prominent researchers in diabetes, which then kind of ultimately sparked your interest, it sounds like, and, and led you on your career. When you think of all those things, can you complete the sentence, because of Mount Sinai, I? Because of Mount Sinai, I 
launched and sustained a career as a physician scientist that was extremely rewarding. And if I had gone to another school in another environment, I don't know what I would have done. It might have been very different. It might have been equally pleasurable and uh, rewarding. But this career that I ended up actually having, I owe to the early experiences at Mount Sinai. What have you found the most rewarding in the academic research medicine world that you're in? What's most rewarding about that work for you? Well, it really comes in several flavors, so I, I have trouble picking one. But what I would say is the the joy of discovery is something you can't duplicate or even understand necessarily if you haven't done it. So several times I have made a discovery in the laboratory during my career that was like a aha moment, and I knew it would be important. I knew other people would see it as important, and it was important, you know, in some in some way of looking at the world. And so that's one thing. Second thing that I very much enjoyed was mentorship of other physician scientists. So that was one of my greatest pleasures. And some of my students and other people who I brought along have had extremely successful careers. And that is tremendous. And then, you know, the third would be the institutional leadership kind of uh, element that I never really expected to have, but I ended up having. And there you're operating on a different realm of institutional resources, institutional commitments and missions. And how do you trade off, you know, wanting to do different things, all of which you can't do at the same time. And a lot of judgments to be made. And uh, that's what I enjoyed as well. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of sounds like an interesting combination of kind of micro and macro work that you were able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let me ask, I know that Mount Sinai Medical School is a much different place now than it was 50 years ago when you entered. But I'm wondering, say you've got somebody who's interested in medical school in front of you. What type of wisdom do you share with them about what medical school to choose and what to do when you're there? What I would say is, I remain enthusiastic about medicine as a profession. So my wife is a physician scientist. We have two daughters. Both of them are physicians. And both of the, one of their husbands is a physician. So we have, a, and my brother is a, is a physician. So we have now a strong family commitment to the field. And although I see challenges today that are somewhat different from what they were 50 years ago, There were challenges 50 years ago, but it's a very different profession in many ways in terms of how it's organized and what the life is like for people in medicine. But I still remain committed to it. And the thing that I tell people when they ask me is that of all professions that I could think of, medicine probably, though you start thinking about it in a very specific way, medicine, you're a a physician, you take care of patients in different areas, right? the the breadth of what you can do with your life as a physician is enormous. And in some cases, you will start doing one thing and you'll do it all the way to the end. And in other instances, you'll have five or seven different careers. And in fact, I used to tell that every year that I was dean of the Harvard Medical School, I would be there the first day welcoming the incoming class of 165 students. And there are two things that I would tell them. One was just what I said now, that you are entering you know, a, a great profession. It is an evolving profession. And you will do either one thing that satisfies you your whole career, or you'll have multiple different careers and they're all open to you. I would tell you that in every one of the nine years that I did this, I used to tell the students you know, how honored they should be to be at Harvard Medical School. It's ranked the number one school in most rankings. You know, they have tremendous opportunity by being there. I would say, I just want you to know that I didn't go to Harvard Medical School. I didn't get into Harvard Medical School. I didn't go to Harvard College or get into Harvard College. And I didn't get into any of the residencies that are associated with Harvard. But somehow, here I am, and now I'm the dean of the school. And what I could tell you is while you're enjoying your experience at Harvard, realize that there are a couple of thousand people out there in other schools who are 
wanting to do great things and you're going to be dealing with them going forward. So don't get too full of yourself at Harvard Medical School. That is something I said every year and I look forward to saying it. <laughs> That's so great. Do you have any hopes for Mount Sinai? I hope that it continues on a trajectory of accomplishment. I hope that it stays true to its roots in the sense of being committed to the practice of medicine, to the science of medicine, to the outreach of medicine to communities. And I think that the biggest threat that I always see to all institutions is that they become captured by trends or attitudes that um, may not be the right ones, but become hard to resist at a certain point in time. So I don't know exactly which ones I would point out, but I would say be reflective about how well you're fulfilling your mission and which mission you're, you're fulfilling. So really, my final question is, when you think back over your you know, experiences from medical school at Mount Sinai on through your very distinguished career, is there anything else that you want to make sure to capture, particularly when you think about maybe new medical students, new people coming into medicine, listening to this? I could say a lot of things, but the short thing I would say is that I would, I would note the fact that my time at medical school at Mount Sinai on one level feels like it's unbelievably a long time ago, and it is in a normal human life. It's a long time ago. Uh, on the other hand, it feels like yesterday. And some of the most powerful experiences I can have in my life is thinking back to those days, talking with some of my old friends. Unfortunately, some of the most, if not all, of the faculty that I used to know then are not with us anymore. But I would I would tell people that you know, just set themselves up to enjoy and store away the memories of what they have, even when some of them may be less pleasant, but it will be a great part of their future recollections and their future life as an older individual to uh, be able to recall those events because they're so formative to, you know, a professional life. What is clear to me is that throughout your career, you've been able to kind of keep that wonder and enthusiasm that you had for medicine as a new medical student throughout your career. And I just really appreciate you making time to sit and share it with me. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.